kid, I was driving in a car with my aunt. And I remember sitting in the back seat and I remember looking up and seeing birds standing on a telephone pole. And I remember watching the birds step off the telephone pole and start to fly. And I remember telling her, you know, when I get older, I'm gonna do that. And she kind of looked at me and she's like, well, Jeb, when you get older, you're gonna start to realize that that's just physically not possible. And I remember looking at her and thinking, well, yeah, maybe not for you. A small group of base jumpers have recently developed an even more dangerous pursuit, known as wingsuit proximity flying. Instead of jumping away from walls and rock faces, these daredevils fly within touching distance of them. Impact is fatal. Among this group, one man has become notorious. His name is Jeb Corliss. I was diagnosed with a condition when I was younger called counterphobia, an almost pathological desire to confront fear. Jeb is now planning his most technically demanding flight yet. He will attempt to fly down the side of one of the world's most dangerous mountains, the Matterhorn in Switzerland. When things have scared me, I have been compelled to do them. But will Jeb's compulsion to confront his biggest fears result in triumph or tragedy? established himself as one of the world's most daring base jumpers, Jeb Corliss is now taking the new craze of wingsuit proximity flying to another level. His ability to confront fear has allowed him to rise above even his closest rivals. If you want to do something spectacular, something special, something unique, you have to be willing to take really special, really unique risks. finally come to that point in time where skill is matching technology and we're capable of doing something really remarkable. After getting within a few feet of the Christ statue in Rio de Janeiro, Jeb now wants to attempt his most difficult proximity flight to date, down the entire length of the Matterhorn in Switzerland. When I did the Christ statue, it was really incredible and really amazing, but I was only close for like that. You know, it was only a split second that I was actually close to something. When we get to Matterhorn, the entire flight down the ridge, you're close to things. In recent years, Jeb has made it his mission to fly from some of the world's most famous landmarks. It's very interesting for me to fly from icons. It symbolizes a, an area, it symbolizes a place, so when you do something there, you are becoming part of that place. Now 33, Jeb lives in the exclusive millionaire's neighborhood of Malibu with his mother and stepfather. He's about to tell them the full details of his next project. I'm going to Switzerland to fly down 
the Matterhorn in close proximity, like, you know, fly maybe five feet off the, the mountain the whole way down. That's what we're doing. That concerns me. There is a part of me that questions whether you're capable of doing it. I clearly love him. He's not my natural born son, but I know how I feel in my heart. But I would be okay if you died. Yeah. I would get over it. It would bother me. Mm -hmm. But I understand you have a dream, mm -hmm. and this is part of your dream. Your mother, I'm not sure how well she would handle it. I would cry, and I would be sad. And, but I would also feel that I was blessed, that I had the moment to know him. I had many moments of knowing him. If he doesn't make it, then he was doing what he wanted to do. Yeah. He was succeeding, and he was in his moment. He was in his second. And I say, bravo. To some degree, he's being reckless with his mother's heart. I don't think so at all. You, you guys saw me when I was unhappy. You saw me when I was depressed. You saw me when I didn't want to be around this planet anymore. You know what I mean? Would you rather me be like that? Or would you rather me be like I am? The truth of the matter is, is I have to live my life the way I can. Mom will have to deal with whatever happens the way she has to deal with it. But she'll still be alive and she still got to live the life she chose. And guess what? She'll have to be happy for me that I died doing something that I love and that was important to me. Check the time. Barry? Yes, sir. Um, lunch is ready. I know. I'll be back in a The last thing I really need in my life <laughs> when I'm doing the things that I do are other people's opinions on what I do. I mean, I, I know what I need to do to survive and I do what I do. And that's it, you know? And if I have, I'm sitting there thinking about, oh, well, this is upsetting my mother or this is upsetting my stepdad or oh, this is upsetting my family. That doesn't help me and it doesn't change the fact that I still need to do it. So I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't talk to my mom about this kind of stuff. Jeb's desire to take risks and confront his deepest fears was born out of a troubled upbringing. This is actually video of my family and I traveling through Nepal when I was about six years old. His parents' decision to travel the world meant an itinerant childhood. Jeb often struggled to fit in. That's what my childhood was. Traveling back and forth from countries all over the world back to the States. I was always a new kid. Um, from first to sixth grade, I went to six different schools. So every year, you know, I'm the new guy. I always felt very alone. I always felt very bizarre. I always felt very weird. I, I felt like an outcast. He got in a lot of trouble. The people that he tried to be friend, thought he was a weirdo. I was getting fights almost daily. It was never me against one other guy, it was always me against like four or five other guys. I learned early on that fear was a very powerful tool. The only way to win in a situation like that is to be horrifying and to be so absolutely scary that no one wants to come anywhere near you. I would hurt someone so bad they wouldn't fight with me anymore because they, they understood the consequences were so severe. I had no friends, nobody. I was by myself. I was a very sad child. I was a very unhappy little child. Jeb also had a difficult relationship with his father. You have parents that basically consider you worthless, strange. That's the mirror that you're getting. And that's what you're going to feel. That's what you're going to think about. Jeb's parents divorced when he was eight years old. I really didn't talk to anybody through my teen years at all. I mean, I was completely isolated. When I was 16 years old, I became very 
suicidal, like actively pursuing things that could end my life. He was very depressed. I used to walk with him almost every day, and he would talk about how unhappy he was, how the only solution was committing suicide. I didn't really want a future. I didn't really, I didn't want anything. I didn't really care. Nothing mattered to me. And all I know is that that feeling made me want to do things that were really, really dangerous. When I saw base jumping, I thought, man, that's absolutely perfect. If I do it, I can do something that very few other human beings in this world are willing to do. If I fail and die while doing it, well then I get what I want. So for me, it was either way I win. I'm not gonna just throw my life away. I'm not just gonna waste that death. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that death to do something spectacular. my search for death, I really did find my life. Ready? 10 seconds. Alright. But while he found life, Jeb remained on the fringes of society. Base jumping was both controversial and often illegal. Determined to make his mark, he became obsessed with conquering some of the world's most iconic structures. His desire to go one better with every jump eventually led him to the new discipline of wingsuit proximity flying. One, there. But it was his attempt to jump from the top of New York's Empire State Building that would have the biggest impact on his life. I studied that building. It became kind of an obsession of mine. It became a passion of mine. It became something I really wanted to do. Despite his careful planning, Jeb couldn't have predicted the effect it would have on his ambition to fly the Matterhorn. It would ultimately prove to be one jump too far. In 2006, Jeb Corliss had planned an incredible jump from one of the world's most famous buildings the Empire State in New York. You can't jump while people have their hands on you, because that's not jumping, that's called falling. And the last thing you want to do is fall off this building. No. I will fall and die if you do not let me go. And their reaction was, you know, you will not jump off this building we, under any circumstance, no matter what we have to do. Let me go. Jeb was stuck on the ledge of the 86th floor, with the Manhattan traffic moving a thousand feet below him. They started getting out handcuffs. And as I saw the handcuffs, I realized, man, if they handcuff me to these bars, and my parachute opens, air will grab my canopy and it will rip me from this building, severing my arms from my body and killing me. So I went through a process of trying to keep them from handcuffing me to the bars. His actions had triggered a major security alert in New York. 
After more than half an hour, Jeb was finally arrested and held by the NYPD. The aborted jump became the biggest news story in the US. And post 9-11, the New York authorities were not going to let his audacious stunt go unpunished. They would make an example of him, charging and convicting him of reckless endangerment. Now, nearly three years later, he's been forced to interrupt his preparations for the Matterhorn in order to be sentenced. But Jeb is confident it will be nothing more than a formality. It's my first offense, misdemeanor, so hopefully they won't go too hard, you know? Jeb's mother has flown in to offer her support. But just hours before the hearing, they received some unexpected news. Basically, my attorney said that a, a lot of very powerful people in New York City have been sending letters to the judge asking that I get the maximum sentence of one year in prison. After years of confronting extreme fear and defying death, Jeb finds himself in a situation beyond his control. Do you feel fearful? That word has so many meanings. And of course, you're always scared of the unknown. It's just the way it is. You don't know what's going to happen, so of course it scares you. I'm a human being just like everybody else. It's turning out to be a lot more hardcore than I was expecting it to be. The very thing that gave Jeb his freedom is now in danger of taking it away. Yeah. And his plan to fly the Matterhorn seems further away than ever. In here. To make matters worse, Jeb's assistant attorney informs him that if he is sentenced to jail, he will be taken down immediately. I go away right now. And I know that it could create an emotional and difficult moment. I'm sorry that I have to give you that speech. If they take him somewhere, where are they taking him? I can go to Rikers Island. Yeah. Rikers Island is a notoriously violent prison. Jeb's fate is now in the hands of the sentencing judge. Okay, Mark, come on. What was planned as an elaborate stunt has led Jeb to the brink of a prison sentence. Community service. Congratulations, it's over. Against the odds, Jeb escaped a prison sentence, but he will be on probation for the next three years. Were you doubtful about the outcome? Yeah, I was pretty sure they were going to put me in. You did. I've become very good at dealing with fear. It's basically what I do you now since I was a little kid. It's always been about dealing with fear. I think the fear sitting in front of the judge about to be put in prison was very unique because it, it was a very horrifying idea to have my freedom taken away. Jeb has returned to his native California, where he can now make the final preparations for the proximity flight he has planned in Switzerland. It is interesting that I live in a country that's like motto is, you know, land of the free. Yet, in order to participate in the sport that I love and the activity that I love, I have to get on an airplane and fly to Europe. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. <laughs> 
Shortly after the sentencing, Jeb was forced to move out of his parents' home and into his own apartment. I got convicted uh, and I got sentenced and then I came home and then it just so happens my parents decided to get a divorce. So I had to move out. So I had to move out of Malibu and I moved to Venice, California and this is my new place. This is where I'm living now. So, you know, it's kind of actually, it's a little bit exciting to be living somewhere new. You know, I've been in the same place for 16 years, feeling a little bit, you know, stagnant. And now I'm getting to move and things are happening, you know. Jeb is about to make a final practice jump before he travels to Europe. He is one of the few people in the world experienced enough to attempt wingsuit proximity flying. Considered the most dangerous feat in the skydiving world, proximity flying picks up where base jumping left off. Going against all human instinct, these thrill seekers aim to fly as close as possible to walls and buildings. Traveling at speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour, there is little margin for error. The wingsuit itself gives the pilot's body the shape of an airfoil, creating lift through the fabric sewn between the legs and underneath the arms. They've sewn in a way where the wingsuit actually has two surfaces. It has a front surface and it actually has a back surface. And then the two are actually sewn together with ribs in between. The wind is then forced into these little vents. On this wing, it's forced into this vent. And as the wind is forced into the vent, it actually pressurizes the wing. So all those little channels are filled with air and it becomes like an air mattress and is, and is pressurized. Not like an aircraft that has like, you know, flaps that move, we don't have that. So what we do is we actually move our hands and move our body in order to change the shape of the wing, which changes our directions. Really, we're more gliding than flying. I mean, it feels like you're flying, but you're really gliding. It is illegal to proximity fly down mountains in the US. With his probation in mind, Jeb has devised another way to train. He'll fly within a few feet of a parachutist, maneuvering the wingsuit to get within touching distance. Holding a close proximity to the parachutist over several thousand feet poses a similar challenge to what Jeb will face flying down the steep slopes of the Matterhorn. Jumping with Luigi in his little canopy, it gives me a target to fly with, and it helps me train precision. stay together from about 10,000 feet all the way down to around 3,000 feet. So it went really, really well. It's about as perfect as you could possibly do something like that. Precision isn't Jeb's only concern. Deploying his parachute at exactly the right altitude is vital. Luigi Carney is a legend among the skydiving community, holding the record for the world's fastest freefall. During a recent jump in the Alps, he had difficulties opening his chute because of the sub-zero temperatures and is concerned Jeb will suffer a similar fate. On my very, very first jump in the Alps, I made a mistake to leave the helicopter, not grabbing my handle. Yeah. So when I went to grab my handle to deploy, even though it was just a high altitude hop and pop, I couldn't feel anything. Okay. I couldn't grab the handle at all. So just within a second of leaving the aircraft, your hands were already frozen, you couldn't feel anything? Even before I left the airplane, your hands my are hands are frozen. Because, I mean, the concern is not being able to open my parachute. I mean, if I reach back and I can't get my pilot chute and I can't pull my pilot chute out, well, then I die. I don't know. I don't even know how to test that. I don't know what to say. I just, <laughs> I just think what you're doing is you just keep getting harder and harder, and I'm so glad I'm not in your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I will be paranoid about this and make this our priority. I, I'm going to make it my yeah. priority. His daring projects have divided opinion in the past 
and even Luigi acknowledges that Jeb is willing to take risks to the extreme. I believe Jeb is willing to lose his life in order to, to accomplish what he's doing. He's one of the very, the very few people that I know that has that you know, personality, you know, that, that drive for what he's pursuing. Let's put it that way, that's a jump that I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> Jeb Corliss has arrived in Europe, where he hopes to finally realize his dream of making a proximity flight down the Matterhorn. He is on his way to northern Italy, where he will complete a final training jump before heading to Switzerland. Jeb will jump from Monte Brento, a mountain favored by experienced proximity flyers because of its near vertical cliff face. Mont Brento is a 4,500 foot cliff. The actual vertical is probably two and a half thousand feet. We need to go do some jumps so that when we get to Matterhorn, we can maximize our time there to get as close as I possibly can to that mountain. But the cliffs of Monte Brento will always bring back painful memories for Jeb, offering a stark reminder of the dangers of proximity flying. Last time I came and jumped this mountain was with my friend Dwayne. He was considered to be the greatest space jumper on the face of Earth, and he was one of my, my good friends, and he was, you know, actually, he was kind of one of my heroes. Dwayne was one of these kinds of guys who always has to push it harder than anybody. That was like his whole thing. In October 2003, Jeb and Dwayne Weston had a wingsuit flight planned at a bridge in Colorado. The bridge is called the Royal Gorge, it's a thousand foot bridge. And I'd been contacted by the organizers and they had asked me if I could fly a wingsuit under, under that bridge. While Jeb flew underneath, Dwayne was to fly above the bridge as close as he possibly could. But despite his experience, Dwayne appeared nervous ahead of the jump. Like, he was genuinely scared, which I thought was a little bit strange because, to me, this jump really wasn't that complicated. And as we're flying over the bridge, Dwayne grabs me by my hand and he looks me in the eyes and says, you know, Jeb, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, okay. It kind of struck me as a bizarre thing for him to say. We jump out, I start flying, and I don't really see Dwayne during the flight that much. I just see him out of my peripheral a little bit because he was above me. I look at the bridge, I'm focused on it, and I notice that at the angle that I'm flying, I can see that I'll actually hit the bridge. So what I do is I actually collapse my legs, I start folding in a little bit to drop some altitude. And as I'm dropping some altitude, I then pick up my line again, I'm like, okay, now I can get underneath the bridge. So I open up my wingsuit and I start flying up underneath the bridge. As I'm coming up underneath the bridge, all of a sudden I see Dwayne's parachute deploying in my face. So I actually swerve sideways, miss him by maybe five feet. And as I go by him, all of a sudden, I start seeing all this other stuff floating in the sky. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on. I'm thinking, are people throwing stuff off the bridge? What's going on? I mean, I didn't understand why there was all this other stuff in the air. God. Somebody's dead. Oh. I open, I turn, I land. And a woman who was actually sitting right next to me where I landed said, Dwayne hit the bridge and he's dead. And I'm like, what? I mean, my first thought is that's impossible. You can't hit that bridge. I mean, you just can't hit that bridge. Dwayne was killed on impact. He was just 30 years old. When Dwayne died, it really made me reevaluate everything that I was doing and why I was doing it. And I started realizing that I wanted to focus more on 
doing new and unique things that I've never done before or that no one's ever done and make sure that when I do go out there and I put my life on the line that it's for something special and something unique and something powerful. The night before the Monte Brento jump, Jeb makes a phone call to his mum. I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm okay. Okay. So, uh, do you think you'll be able to come to Switzerland? Yep, I should go today. Okay. Well, what do you think the chances are? Um, if they look pretty good, actually. Really? Yeah, we'll see. Huh. All right. Hopefully you'll be able to. It'd be nice if you finally got to see me do something like this. I know. I know. They could maybe even be in the helicopter and watch me jump. I'm excited about it. It'll be fun. Okay, I love you, Jim. I love you, too. Okay, bye. Bye. The only time she's ever actually seen me do a jump was when I base jumped off the Palace Hotel. And she was on, I think, the 40th floor, and I was on the 50th floor, and I passed her window in free fall. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, lots of people are like, oh, I don't tell my parents because I don't want to make them nervous. I love telling them. <laughs> I like making my parents nervous. I, I don't know, I'm a bad person, but <laughs> for some reason I get like a sick joy out of it. The only thing I like more than my fear is other people's fear. For some reason, I feed on other people being scared, so it's kind of, it makes it more fun for me. It's the morning of the jump, but strong winds have put Jeb's proximity flight in doubt. Monte Brento has a fearsome reputation claiming the lives of six base jumpers in five years. But Jeb decides to go ahead with the flight. So you jump off, give a good countdown. I'll go just a hair after you. He'll be joined in the air by fellow wingsuit pilot Dave Barlier, who will film the flight. Fear is what keeps you safe. It's what keeps you from doing things that can basically kill you. So what happens is you have to manage that whenever you're doing high-risk activity. You have to try to block out the fear that's, that's negative, which is going to actually cripple you and make you so you can't function, but you have to let in the fear that's going to keep you safe. And you know, I, I'm not superhuman, I'm just like everybody else, you know, as scared as another person is standing on the edge of a building and jumping off is exactly how scared I am. Ten seconds. Traveling at speeds in excess of a hundred miles per hour, Jeb and Dave are flying just meters away from the cliff face. Their flight is going to plan, despite the strong headwinds. But as they make their final descent, Jeb makes a reckless decision. He drops altitude so that Dave can film him, sending him off course from his landing zone. Basically, if this branch above me breaks, I'm going to break both my legs. I'm going to hit that rock right there and both my legs will be broken. So, I need to get off this thing now and the branch is breaking above me. While he waits for the mountain rescue team, Jeb attempts to free himself from the wingsuit. foot is really stuck there. Oh, because it's that fucking camera. But the camera mount attached to Jeb's ankle has trapped his foot in the harness. Fucker. Oh, I can't. I was gonna break. Fuck, man. I'm gonna break my foot. Ah. Fucking hurry, dude. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. We try to help you with the rope. 
Try to catch this rope. Ale. Oh, get off from the camera and help him. The camera crew must step in to help Jeb. After struggling for almost an hour, the rescue team finally pull him free from the trees. No, no, no. You sure? Positive. No, because I'm part of the rescue team. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Good? Yeah. Thanks, guys. Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> My foot's okay. Is it really? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. My hand is not okay. Yeah. I think this bone is now badly broken. I don't know what went wrong in my hand and now it's like just every time I move it just like there's like cracking and popping and there's like stuff moving around in there that just feels really unnatural. Jeb has arrived at the hospital to find out the extent of the damage to his hand. If it's broken, he may not be able to control his wingsuit or deploy his parachute at the end of the flight. An hour passes. When he finally emerges, the news isn't good. It's broken. Badly. And <laughs> it's actually broken in two places. Would you say that Matterhorn is in the balance? Oh, I'm jumping, Matterhorn. It's happening. If, I have, if they try to put a cast on me, I'm walking out. And then I'll jump Matterhorn, and then after I'm done jumping, then I'll go put a cast on it. If that's what they say, if they say I need a cast, then I'll do it after Matterhorn. But I'm jumping Matterhorn. There's, it's not like an important hand. It's like the left hand. The important hand is the right hand, because that's what I pull with. And then, like, really, I don't even need my hand, technically. I can just kind of, like, you know, use my wrists. <laughs> Whatever, I'm jumping, I don't care. Let's go. <laughs> People ask you why you do certain things. Really, what it's about is, you know, you have a dream, and you try to turn those dreams into reality. You know, I had a dream to fly the Matterhorn. For me, success is saying, hey, guess what? I dreamt about it, and now I'm doing it. After years of dreaming and months of careful planning, Jeb Corliss is just hours away from the most technically demanding proximity flight of his career. Jeb takes a close look at the mountain for the first time. The landing spot will put the over there by that the road. Yeah, by that road. Jumping from a helicopter 600 meters above the mountain's peak, he will attempt to fly within a few feet of the jagged surface. Okay, so we're going to be coming up over that ridge, flying down this ridge line. Basically, on the first one, I'm going to be super duper conservative, uh -huh. probably. Perfect day. I mean, you can ask for better than this. On the ground, Jeb's safety will be in the hands of Harry Lauber. A veteran of the Alps, he has over 25 years' experience working with climbers and skiers. But it will be the first time he's been responsible for a wingsuit pilot. I like to see people do this kind of stuff. It's life. Don't think about what can happen or whatever. It's the experience, the adrenaline. I understand that. I love that. As soon as you're landing, grab your stuff yeah, and just move. Go. Yeah. move over to And I'm also aware that uh, whenever they do something, the possibility that something happens is always there. Never go to the mountain and think, Nothing can happen. There's no 100% safety. Never. This is probably going to be one of the colder environments I've ever jumped in. I'm going to be jumping in below zero temperatures. Also, on top of that, this is going to be a jump where I'm going to be coming in really close to something and then hugging it for maybe three or 4,000 feet. The jump will be made even more difficult after it was confirmed that Jeb broke his hand in two places in Italy. They show me the x-rays and explain to me how important it is that I put a cast on it. And I'm like, I can't put a cast on it right now. I just I have too much stuff going on. I have to do this first and then I can pack, put a cast on it. Um, luckily, I don't need it to fly. It's only a... 
<laughs> I still have wings and arms and everything. They all work good. Jeb's wingsuit flight requires absolute accuracy in judging an angle of descent. Here's our landing area right here. Okay? Here's Matterhorn. Here's our landing area. We're flying like this across. And what we'll be doing is, as we're flying towards it, we'll give you little adjustments. This way means five degrees, that turn that way, that way, five degrees that way. So then I, I, once I see my angle is good, I'm just gonna step out and then you just keep flying. Okay. That's it. Let's see, I'm gonna jump out of a helicopter at 16,000 feet, fly down the Matterhorn at probably a 50 degree angle in wingsuits, probably you know at, at points being within 10 to 50 feet away from the, the actual cliff moving around 180 miles an hour. Does that sound dangerous to you? I understand the risks involved in what I do. You have to be willing to accept the consequences for your actions. And you have to understand what those consequences are. You know, I go into it expecting death. I was so close. Oh, I can't breathe. <laughs> I'm like lining up on it, lining up on it. I'm like, I'm gonna get close, I'm gonna get close. And all of a sudden I start powering into it. And I'm like, oh, sh literally for a split second, I'm like, oh, I'm too close. I scared myself so much. You have no idea how scared I was. I was like, oh my God, I shouldn't be this close. I get over it, I'm just like, oh, and I'm like, this feeling of relief as I came over, I was like, yes. You know, uh, when you dream about something, you have all these preconceived ideas of what it's gonna be, how, you know, you think, wow, this is gonna be really cool, you know? I hope that it will live up to my expectations. 
And then you do it and you're like, holy crap, that was so much cooler than I thought it was gonna be. That ridge with those little pinnacles coming up off of it, as you're flying down, I mean, you're underneath them, you're like flying in between them and you're just like coming down the ridge going, oh, it felt so good. That's the absolute best proxy flying I've ever done in my life, without, without question. How you doing? How are you? I'm doing spectacular. Great. Yeah, so basically we're done. We're finished, everything's okay, I'm uninjured, it all worked out perfectly. Oh, great, 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 great. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. I was so worried the <laughs> night before you did that that I didn't sleep, so I'm really happy to hear that it went well. Tell me about what happened. What did you do? What, how did it work? I, I don't know, dude. I, how close did you get to the mountain? Close. <laughs> I don't know. I basically, I jumped out of the helicopter, I, I, I approached the mountain, I flew over the ridges, like, you know, five, mm -hmm. ten feet, flew down the whole mountain. It was fun. It was really, it was a lot more than I expected it to be. It was really exciting. So I'm... I'm five, ten feet? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Well, you know, it was fun. Well, that's amazing. That's beyond belief. Beyond belief. You're an amazing, amazing, amazing person. Thank yeah. God you're my child. Yeah, well, Thank you for picking me, sweetheart. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I love you too, Mom, and I'll, I'll see you when I get back. Okay, I can hardly wait. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good one, bye-bye. I do believe that certain people have certain gifts. Some people are incredible painters. Some people are amazing singers. Some people are great with children. You know, and all of these different gifts are, are unique to them. They excel in these areas. My gift is fear. For some people, they need these kind of activities in order to feel free and to feel fulfilled. You know, and I happen to be one of those people. I happen to be one of those kinds of people who need to do these kinds of things in order to be a happy person. I mean, life is just a bunch of experiences you have till you die. That's really it. It's simple, you know? And I just want to make those experiences as incredible as I possibly can. An emotional struggle in the Yukon wilderness for Ed Wardle, who's feeling very much alone in the wild. Thursday at nine on four. Next up, Keith Allen locates a great cook whose reputation preceded him and whose TV shows broke the mold. Ever the genial host, Keith Floyd. Mm -hmm.